Hey everybody, today we're gonna to be talking about entropy and you can see from the graphic that I have here on the screen that it's kind of breaking apart. And that kind of ties into a little bit about what entropy is. So entropy is another thermodynamic thing that we need to consider when we take a look at chemical reactions. And the big thing we've been talking about so far is enthalpy. And enthalpy really does drive chemical processes. We've talked about how an exothermic reaction is favored because it's negative, it's decreasing in potential energy, and that's great. But what drives chemical reactions is actually another part as well, and it's this thing called entropy. So we're gonna kind of dig into this a little bit today. Um, you're gonna see that the college board is gonna look at this in math terms, but I think more often than not, they're gonna look at it in, in conceptual terms, which means it's rare that you're gonna see a math problem, more common that you're gonna see a situation that you've gotta kind of take in and guess what the change in entropy is going to be. So the first question is, what is entropy? Now, I'm going to tell you right away that my definition is probably not the most technically correct explanation, but the correct explanation of entropy is kind of above and beyond what you need to know for the AP exam. So when we get in talking about very technical definitions of entropy, they talk about these things called microstates and stuff like that. And it gets kind of complicated because it is kind of complicated. But what we need to know for the exam is kind of the basics of it. So the basics of it is that entropy is a measurement of the dispersal of energy and matter. And when we talk about entropy changes, we are talking about how does our dispersal change? I'm going to always go dispersal. How does that change um, from the start of our process with our reactants to the end of our process in our products? Um, <clears throat> and so what ends up happening is that the more dispersed something is, the higher the entropy value is in any kind of process. So if we start off with being more kind of organized and then our stuff spreads out at the end, that spread out stuff has a higher entropy value for it. Um, and there are a lot of kind of like rules about entropy of the universe and that kind of stuff. And that's really great stuff, but it's not necessary for what we're gonna be doing on the AP exam. So we're just gonna kind of give it the heap ho. When we talk about entropy, entropy is represented by the letter S for reasons. Um, I think we're just running out of letters, honestly, at this point. So it's represented with the letter S. It will sometimes have the little degree symbol like we talked about with the standard condition, so 298 Kelvin. And in this case, entropy is actually measured in a different unit. We've been talking about kilojoules for forever. Entropy is measured in joules, first of all, because it's kind of a tiny thing. But what happens is it's joules per mole Kelvin, which means that it's temperature dependent. So that means that as I increase the temperature of my substance, the entropy value is increasing and it depends on that temperature. So as my temp goes up, my entropy increases. And if you think about how a particle or a substance behaves, as I heat something up, we've got our particles moving more and more and more. So they're kind of more dispersed in a given area and they're moving around more. But it's temperature dependent. So when we do calculations in the future times, we're gonna have to pay attention to units. So keep that in the lockbox. Okay. Like I said, on the exam, a lot of times what they're gonna ask you to do is just be cognizant of the changes in entropy that are happening. So you've gotta be able to look at a process and then you've gotta be able to figure out what is happening from one transition to the other. So we're gonna talk about things that increase entropy. So it increases the dispersion of our substances. And then obviously the opposite thing would decrease entropy. And a lot of times they're going to ask you to think about increases and decreases and discuss those. So remember an increase in entropy, that's positive, okay? And a decrease in entropy, so it's less dispersed, that's negative. And I should come back to Negative changes in entropy aren't great. Positive entropy is much more likely. 
Because if you think about it, let's let's think about like your room. Your room, it's real hard to keep anything clean, whether it's your bedroom, your house, your kitchen. Kitchens are real bad and hard to keep clean. And part of that is because it is so easy to have things not in their correct place. So if you think about what naturally happens, it is much more easy for your stuff to be dispersed all over the place than it is for it to be in its exact proper place. And it's harder to contain. Nature favors positive changes in entropy. So that is what is more likely to happen because it's just going to naturally kind of spread out on its own. Okay. So back to our examples here. Entropy of a substance always increases as it changes from a liquid to a gas. So if we go from mercury liquid to mercury vapor, the entropy is going to be higher in the gas than it is the liquid. So our change is a positive delta S. Okay. When a pure solid or liquid dissolves in a solvent, the entropy of that substance increases as well. So think about taking a solid, nice and organized in its little lattice, and then you put it into a solution and it disperses out. So that's a positive change. There's one change and it's carbonates. They're an exception. Carbonates like to interact with water. They like buddy up with water. And so they actually bring more order to the system. That is more of a fun fact than anything you're going to be tested on the exam, but it is kind of interesting. It produces carbonic acid and makes our life a little bit difficult. So an example of this would be, like I said, salt and water. Got salt dissolved in there. The very nice ionic lattice of NaCl gets broken apart, and those particles are spread out over a bigger area. So we have a positive entropy change. Another example of something that increases entropy is if I have gas escaping from a solvent. And the best example you can think of in this case is like fizzing in a soda. So if you think of a soda that's, you know, sealed shut, it's got carbon dioxide dissolved in there. And then when you open it up, the carbon dioxide comes out of solution and then it fizzes. And that's an increase in entropy for that system. Okay. The next one is that Entropy generally increases the more complex your molecule is. So if we start off with very small molecules or atoms, it's got a pretty small entropy. And the bigger your atom, um, not your atom, but your molecule gets, you have more moving electrons in there. And so you're going to have a higher entropy value for that. So an example of that would be like KCl versus calcium chloride. I've got two chlorines. And so I have many more electrons moving around in there. And so I'm going to have a higher entropy value for that. And then I believe this is the last one. Reactions increasing the number of moles of particles often increase entropy as well. You have to be aware with this though. You've got to watch your phases. So for instance, in the case of this guy here, I've got two H2O gaseous moles on my reactant side, and I have three moles on the product side. That is going to be an increase in entropy. But if somehow these turned into two solids, that would not. So there's kind of always a couple different things you've got to pay attention to. You've got to pay attention to phases, and you've got to pay attention to quantities and molecular complexity. There's kind of a lot going on, but it gets easy as we practice. We're going to do a ton of practice in class, so that will help you get things cleared up as well. If we're talking about math, the big entropy calculation you could potentially use is our good friend products minus reactants. So we could take the entropy values of formation, those same kind of ones that you have, the standard entropies, and then we could um, use those and do a products minus reactants calculation where I would have to give you the values and you could find them out. Interesting little nugget though, is that entropy is at zero kilojoules per mole for everything at absolute zero, because that means it's so cold that the molecular speed is essentially zero, okay? But what that also means is that elements, because they are at room temperature, especially at 298 degrees, or 298 Kelvin, is that their entropy values aren't zero. So when we're doing a calculation in an entropy situation, you cannot ignore the zeros. Do you see that very often? No, they have to give you the table value, like the value with the table. I don't think you're gonna have to run into it, but just something to keep in mind. Okay, so I have two entropy examples that I wanna talk to you about. One is a conceptual problem and one is a math problem. And they're both lifted from the AP exam. 
And so we're going to take a look at both of them. So the first one here says that fulminic acid can convert to isocyanic acid according to the equation below. I believe we did this one in our bond enthalpy video, but it's a great thermodynamics question that has multiple parts. So we're going to kind of keep digging into it. And it gives you the two Lewis structures here. And then it says a student claims that delta S for the reaction is close to zero. Explain why the claim is accurate. So I'm going to switch over to my doc cam to make this happen. And we're going to have a little chat about making, um, making stupid mistakes on our AP exam. You're going to say that's not very nice, but so here's something I saw. This actually is the question that I graded on the AP exam. And so if we look at this, you have to make sure that you answer the question. So it says, explain why the student's claim is accurate. One of the things I saw on the AP exam is that people were like, the student is not accurate. No, if the college board tells you they are correct, that means they're correct and you have to go through and explain why they're correct. So they're telling you delta S is close to zero. So there isn't much of a change in entropy from reactant to product. And if you think about fulminic acid and isocyanic acid, there are a number of reasons why this could be zero. And we accepted a ton of different answers because there's a lot of different things going on. So if you think about the list of stuff we had going on, there are a couple of different things that make this possible. Okay. Now, I would answer this in like, you know, full sentences and all that kind of stuff or close to full sentences. But the explanations that you could possibly use in this case are there is no change in phase from reactants to products. Okay, so we stay gas to gas from reactants to products. Another thing we could use is that we could say that there are a symbol, similar number of bonds, so it is a similar molecular complexity. Okay, and if we take a look here, we also have it one mole of reactant going to one mole of product. So we could also argue that there is the same number of moles from reactant to product. And it wouldn't hurt if you talked about a couple of these as we went along either. Like that's not going to, they're not going to do that. Remember though, when you do these, I don't need you to write a novel. So a sentence about this would be pretty good. So I would say the student is accurate in saying there's no change because there's no change in phase from reactants to products. And that's all you need is a sentence. One sentence to really explain your thought process here. And a lot of the problems on the exam are going to ask you to do that. Now, some of them might explicitly say, tell me what the sign is on the entropy change. Some of them might say, um, they ask you to use it in a math problem for like, especially Gibbs free energy, which we'll be getting into in our next video. So this is kind of the basic, I guess, wading our feet into entropy. Now, here is another calculation <clears throat> from another exam. <clears throat> okay. And this is kind of a two-parter here. So this is a math problem that we're going to figure out. So it gives us the standard entropy value for this substance here, urea. And then it does not tell me what the urea's entropy value is when it's aqueous. So I don't know what that value is. It says the entropy change for the dissolution or dissolving of urea is 70.1 joules per mole Kelvin at 25 degrees Celsius. Using the information in the table above, calculate the absolute molar entropy of aqueous urea. Now that seems super scary, but when we read this, it just means solve for the missing stuff in the box, okay? And when they give you a box with these information pieces in there, most of the time, especially if we're talking about multiple entropy values, we are looking at a reactants minus product situation. Oops, I'm sorry. I mixed it up. I'm thinking of bond enthalpy. We think of a products minus reactant situation. 
Now, to prevent this from happening, this is on your equation sheet. So, ooh, not a good look. Okay, so reading this, we've got enough pieces of information that we must be able to do this. Now, the first thing we need is an equation, and it says it's the dissolving of urea. So you know that if we dissolve something, we take it from its solid state to its aqueous state, because I don't feel like writing that. I'm just going to write it as urea solid to urea aqueous. Okay, so that's our whole equation. That is the dissolution of urea. It's nothing fancier than that. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to figure out our entropy value for products minus our reactants. So our reactant is going to be solid urea and aqueous urea is our product. And it tells you that the entropy change for this process is 70.1, a little dinger in my desk here, 70.1 joules per mole Kelvin. So that is the overall change for my reaction, for my process. So I have 70.1 joules per mole Kelvin, and that is equal to the value for my products, which I do not know what that is, so you can put a question mark there. And then my reactants value is 104.6 joules per mole Kelvin. So in this situation, we are solving for this unknown here. If you want to set this as X, you could do that too, whatever makes you feel better about it. So I've got my reaction. I have my pieces, and now it's just time to do a little bit of algebra. So what I want to do is I want to add 104.6. Um, man, I want to put that kilojoule in there. I'm so used to that. Joules per mole Kelvin, and we're going to add that to both sides. So if I add that to both sides, this is some simple addition here, and I get a value for my aqueous of 174.7 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, if you think about that, that should make sense, right? Because if I have something that's aqueous, an aqueous version of the same chemical, it should have a higher entropy value because it's more dispersed. Now, this part here is technically another section, so this would probably be like B, and this would be C. It says, using a particle level reasoning, explain why the delta S of the solution is positive for the dissolution of urea in water. So we've got to discuss why this overall process here is positive. Why is the entropy change positive? So in this case, if you think about what's happening, I'm going from a solid to an aqueous solution. So my particles are being more dispersed. So that's what I have to discuss here. So I'm going to say the delta S, so the change in entropy, is positive because as the solid dissolves, the particles become more dispersed. which increases entropy. Okay. Nine times out of 10, you are going to see an entropy question relating to a conceptual idea. One time out of 10, you might see an entropy calculation as well. But a lot of times, you're gonna be taking a look more at the reactions figuring out what's happening with the sign, and then using that sign to help us figure something else out. So this is entropy. If you have any questions, please get those things cleared up. We're going to take a look at your homework. And if you have any issues with that, please let me know. Otherwise, good luck.